When I think back on the gaming years of my life, there perhaps has never been a more exciting time than the days of early 3D game development. This was a transitory time, where classic series of the 2D era suddenly found the need to reinvent themselves, some for the better and some for the worse. When it came to nailing the transition between dimensions on their first try, none other than Nintendo can be said to have done it better. While games like Super Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, and Metroid Prime were making this transfer look easy, Fire Emblem a series uniquely suited to such a transition due to its overhead turn-based gameplay was gently biding its time, immersed completely in the specialty of portable gaming. Regardless, when it came time for intelligent systems to finally make the transition, they did so with great care. And the world they came up with, and the characters within, have gone on to be some of the most beloved in the series. Set in this new land of Tellius, the tale of Ike and his band of mercenaries flipped a number of series expectations on their head, while at the same time remaining quite close to what had come before. Fire Emblem Path of Radiance is a game that has gone on to become very beloved by series fans. Yet at the same time, there's no denying that we are about to be entering a very dark period for the franchise as a whole. One which would test both its viability as a product for the Western market, as well as the entire survival of the series. The story of this dark age of the Fire Emblem franchise will be something that will take a few more videos to fully cover. But for now, I'd much rather focus on the game at hand. While the worlds and characters of the more modern day Fire Emblems are quite saturated in exposure nowadays, the Tellius games are the last of these that I know almost nothing about, besides, of course, the name of the main character. Similar to my first exposure to Roy through Super Smash Bros., and always wanting to know more about his game, the origins of Ike have always had a similar fascination for me, and I could not wait to jump into this one as soon as I could. As I do for all of these retrospectives, I completed Path of Radiance twice, and this video is going to go very in-depth on everything contained within. In order to fully understand this game and its place in the series, I will be breaking down the history of its development, giving a full rundown of the story along with my own analysis, and then following up on the continuing evolution of the gameplay and systems that this ninth game developed. It's been about one year since I started this series, and I truly have been waiting to say this for a very long time. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get started on the Path of Radiance. Following the unexpected international success of Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade, which was the first Fire Emblem game released outside of Japan, the decision was made within Intelligent Systems to create the next entry in the series on the Nintendo GameCube. The development of Path of Radiance started before the Sacred Stones, with the team all thinking that they were done with the Game Boy Advance. Yet, at some point, this was changed by the ones in charge, and a team dedicated to creating the last Game Boy Advance entry was split off by the developer. While the Sacred Stones would have a fast development time due to the developers' familiarity with the portable hardware that they had worked with for years, the creation of Path of Radiance would be much more of a challenge. This was the Fire Emblem series' first foray into 3D graphics, which, aside from adding depth to character models and environments, also meant that this would be the Fire Emblem team's first time handling camera management, motion capture battle animations, the framing and implementation of in-engine story scenes, and many more complications that an extra dimension brings. Apart from the new graphics, Graphics. For the first time, FMV cutscenes were utilized in-game, inserted throughout the story in a similar way as the Blazing Blade used its CG still art to better express certain scenes. On top of this, in another series first, these scenes were fully voiced, including an English cast for the Western release. Path of Radiance was meant to be a major step up in the presentation of this series, and this was for multiple reasons. Intelligent Systems felt that they had successfully cultivated a love for this series through the high-quality work and general warm reception of the GBA era games, and they felt that the time was right to return back to the console and wow its fans with several sudden advancements in technology all at once. To capitalize on this, Path of Radiance was created to be a satisfying tale on its own, but also one which left clear hooks open for the already planned sequel. This was yet another first for the franchise. Under the direction of Masayuki Horikawa, who took up directing duties for the first time with this entry, the ninth Fire Emblem game eventually saw release on 
on April 20th, 2005 in Japan, with later releases in other territories dropping between October to December of the same year. While the Blazing Blade and Sacred Stone scripts were challenging in their own ways to translate into English, the localization effort of Path of Radiance was on a completely different scale. The new land of Tellius not only introduced multiple new nations, as had been standard with each shift to a new setting, but also many new races which all had their own unique goals, history, and culture. As a result, the localization team frequently worked with the intelligence system staff, giving their all to ensure that the subtle nuance of the script was kept while still making it enjoyable to play through. This kind of purity in adapting the script was not exactly kept for the gameplay. As was done in Fire Emblem 7, effective damage, such as arrows against flyers, was reduced from a 3 times damage boost to 2 times, and a new, easy difficulty option was added into the Western release to again appeal to new adopters of the series. Hard mode, which was called Difficult, also received its own alterations, along with an even harder mode, Maniac, remaining exclusive to the Japanese version. Thankfully, despite the many new risks that this game took, which could have definitely spelled disaster, reception at the time was very positive in all regions. Unfortunately, as time has gone on, the inelegance of this team's first attempt at 3D has become clearer and clearer. By this I mean things like the character models, which especially out of battle, have aged very terribly. But this also goes doubly for the battle animations, whose stiffness and lack of punch stand in stark contrast to the wonderful work which was done in this area throughout Fire Emblem's run on the Game Boy Advance. The overall slowness of the animations, including just using the on-map animations which are supposed to be faster, have led to this entry being known for playing particularly slowly, especially in combination with the frequently massive number of enemy units. While limitations of the in-engine play have become clearer with time, the character design and music have remained as bright as ever. With composing veterans such as Saki Haruyama and others on board, the bombastic and energetic score was accompanied by the striking character work of Senri Kita, who was known for her work with SNK and the Samurai Showdown series. Compared to the other casts yet seen, the character work and music of Fire Emblem 9 really stand out, something which does help to frame this game as a new era in Fire Emblem. Despite all of the effort that was poured into this project, Path of Radiance unfortunately sold significantly worse than the prior two games. This was likely affected by both the GameCube being a largely unsuccessful console in sales, as well as the game's release coming towards the end of its lifespan. Although sales were not bad enough to call it a true failure, this was a troubling first step for Ike and his friends on the journey. Speaking of which, I guess it's about time we get to that actual journey. Before starting, I'm just going to come out and say that this story section is going to be extremely large. Although the events that take place in Path of Radiance are pretty straightforward, much like Genealogy of the Holy War, there is a lot going on that simply needs to be said. And I have done all I can to condense it as best as possible. For the first time since the Fire Emblem 4 video, the following story synopsis is going to be split into multiple parts. Another important detail to add in here is that I am not going to be including any reveals which come from the following game, Radiant Dawn. Since I am playing through this series chronologically and making these videos on each one before moving on, the following synopsis and analysis are going to be formed based on my experience with just this one game, which I actually think is a lot fairer. Players at the time would have no idea if the events in this game would be getting paid off in the sequel or not. So in order to properly analyze it, it's important to look at the experience of just playing this game as its own independent entry. As usual, the following story synopsis and story analysis sections are going to contain full spoilers. And as usual, I'm dropping time codes on screen now for both a jump to the story analysis section at the top of the screen or a jump to the gameplay analysis sections with the time code on the bottom. All right, everyone, it's your last chance to jump forward if you wish, because we're getting started on this adventure in three, two, one. Deep in a forest, somewhere in Crimea, the clatter of wooden swords can be heard. Here, the young mercenary in training, named Ike, was facing off against his father Grail, just as they had done many times before. Despite losing the first round, Ike's determination led him to scoring a win against his father for the first time ever. Despite having been fighting in a way that suppressed his true strength, the father acknowledged the son, and approved of him beginning work as a mercenary. Regrouping back at their camp, Ike was congratulated by his fellow mercenaries. Also living here was Mist, Ike's younger sister and the keeper of of their mother's last memento, a medallion which she always had on her, one that would mysteriously glow from time to time. 
After celebrating his achievement and finally being allowed to start, Ike set out on his first job the very next day. And over the coming days, the young swordsman would overcome challenge after challenge, dealing with bandit raids and putting down some pirates who were harassing a local coastal town. Ike's life was a dangerous but a comforting one, and the actions of the Grail mercenaries gained them a reputation as being an extremely upright and honorable band of heroes for hire. While life would surely have gone on as happily in the years to come, the return the return of another member of their group, the mage Soren, brought with it some disturbing news. The land of Crimea, where the mercenaries resided, was under assault by the kingdom of Dayan to the east. This presented a dilemma to the Grail mercenaries, who were based in Crimea, yet were technically neutral. Ike was placed at the head of a scouting party, sent in order to better understand what the actual situation was like in the Crimean capital of Melior. While out on the mission, the fighters were surprised to find the aftermath of a great battle between standard Dayan troops and the soldiers of the Crimean Royal Guard. Just off the path nearby this deadly scene, Ike's mercenaries discovered a frail young woman, weakened from an earlier encounter. Without knowing her identity, Ike and the crew rescued her, bringing her back to their camp in order to recover. Once the girl finally regained consciousness, she introduced herself surprisingly as the Princess Alencia of Crimea, a royal child who had been hidden from the general public's knowledge due to a conflict of her inheritance. The young girl was able to confirm that her father and mother, the king and queen, were now dead. And soon the mercenaries would learn that the next in line for the throne, her uncle, Lord Renning, had passed away as well. With no one else to turn to, the princess's fate was left at Grail's mercy. And though he wondered if he could truly believe the young girl's claim of being the princess, the sudden appearance by Dayan soldiers demanding her to be turned over convinced the mercenaries of the truth of her story. Realizing that Dayan was setting up an ambush regardless of their cooperation or not, the Grail mercenaries full power was set on display to the soldiers, causing an unexpected rout and victory for Ike and the princess's new defenders. With Dayan now in pursuit, the group had no choice but to leave, following the princess' advice to flee to the nation of Gallia, a mysterious land to the south where a race known as the Lagus, who were beings capable of transforming into tremendous beasts and gaining great strength, ruled the forests within. Part of the way through the group's flight to the south, Grail set off to distract their foe while Ike led the others further. After reaching the safety of a fort close to the border and sending Alencia on ahead to Gallia, Ike went back to ensure the safety of his father. During his journey back, Ike's small group became cornered by the forces of Petrine, a renowned Dayan general and part of the Four Riders, who were King Ashnard of Dayan's strongest forces. Ike's rescue attempt was ironically salvaged only by the man whom they had been seeking, as Grail arrived and personally challenged the arrogant rider, who both relished the chance to finally let loose with their full strength. As Ike witnessed his father outmatch his enemy, Petrine refused to give up, calling in her own reinforcements to surround the father and son. It was at this moment of peril that, thanks to the aid requested by Alencia ahead in Gallia, several beast warriors suddenly arrived, evening the odds between the two forces. Just as a much larger battle was set to take place, from out of the shadows stepped a towering knight, clad all in black armor, who commanded Petrine to stand down and oddly allowed Grail and his son to depart. Following this strange encounter, Ike's group returned to the fort in order to rest. As night fell and the others drifted off to sleep, Ike noticed his father walking silently away from the fort. After joining him and talking with his father amidst the trees, Grail suddenly stopped, noticing that something was amiss, and then directly ordered his son to go back. With Grail proceeding forward into a clearing, a curious Ike secretly followed after him. Hearing the clanging of blade on blade, the young man discovered his father locked in combat with the mysterious Black Knight. During a break in the combat, the Black Knight threw a sword to Grail, encouraging him to use it in order to fight him. Refusing this gift, Grail continued to fight with his axe. Yet despite the mercenary leader's great skill, a thrust from the Black Knight suddenly pierced through him. Just as Ike rushed over to support his father, the Black Knight coldly asked for the location of some object, which Grail refused to reveal. As the knight moved on to threatening Ike, the duo was only saved due to the sound of a great roar, which signaled to the Black Knight that the Beast King of Gallia was watching him, ready to intervene. Seeming to find this concurrence of great power and amusement, the Black Knight chose to depart, leaving the young Ike to carry his mortally wounded father back to the fort. As the young man and father walked 
walked arm in arm, Grail spoke, using his last words to entrust command to his son and to wish him and his daughter to live on in safety. The next morning, Ike and Mist stood at the grave of their great father, as the others in their camp reeled in shock. Putting his mourning to the side, Ike became determined to keep going anyway, stepping outside the fort to find a group of Danes had caught up to their location. Despite doing their very best, the few members of Grail's mercenaries proved to not be enough this time. But thankfully, the group was, again, saved by the sudden arrival of Gallian fighters. Thanks to the intervention of these two, the group was able to proceed at a greater pace, and before long, Ike and his company at last arrived at the Gallian capital. Within, they were able to to meet King Cunegus, who warmly welcomed the group and the Crimean princess into his protection. Although the Great Lion King wished to take a permanent guardianship of Valencia, respecting the good relations he had maintained with her father during his lifetime, the political climate of his nation currently forbade it, as it would seem to the statesmen of Gallia as if the king were intentionally antagonizing Dan and giving them a reason to attack them. Complicating this further were the negative relations that still remained between the Lagoose and the Bayork. There were word for humans. Alencia's best hope instead was to seek help from the Binyan Empire to the Far East, in order to ally them with her cause before Ashnard could launch an assault on Gallia, an action that would likely cause the Binyans to side with Dayan out of their racial connection. In such a situation, the other Laguz tribes, including the bird tribes of Phoenicus and Kilvis, and the dragon tribe of the secluded Goldoa, would likely also be dragged into this conflict in order to help their Gallian cousins. In order to reach Binyan, Ike and his mercenaries had to return to Crimea once again in order to book passage on a ship, stopping along the way only to raid a local prison. Assisting them in this break-in was the thief Volk, a shady character who had been working for Grail before his death. Volk claimed to Ike that he had retrieved some kind of important information that Grail requested, but would only reveal it to him for an outrageous price. While releasing the Crimean prisoners of war, Ike happened to meet a man named Sephiran, a self-proclaimed pilgrim who had been captured for assisting some local Crimean soldiers. After Ike set this man free and bolstered his forces with the freed Crimeans, the group arrived at Port Toha. Here, they were to meet with a man named Nasir, who had a ship ready to take them to Binyan. Despite them trying Trying to keep a low profile, an accident in town revealed their Laguz escort ran off to the townspeople, causing a disturbance that alerted the local Dayan forces to Ike's group. After fighting their way onto the ship, Ranolf stayed behind to guard their departure, fighting off even the Black Knight who had appeared in the town. Despite losing their duel, Ranolf was rescued by the pilgrim Sephiran, who recognized the Black Knight's true identity and assured Ranolf that the knight would never raise his blade against him. Now at sea, Ike, Mist, Alencia, and the others could only hope and pray that putting their last hopes in the Empire of Binyan was the right course of action. Hopefully, this would bring them the salvation they had been fighting for. After the many hardships that Ike and his crew had gone through to get here, the gentle days at sea passed with safety but boredom. Nasir warned the group that these steady, safe days at sea would not last for long, because soon their ship would pass by the territory of the Hawk and Raven Lagus clans, some of which had taken to piracy as well as other questionable contract work. Just as the ship was sailing into these perilous waters, suddenly it stopped in place, having lodged itself into a reef below the water. This happened just as a group of Sky Corsairs intended, and Ike again found himself fighting defensively against a foe coming from all directions. After surviving the pirate attacks, he ventured on the land nearby to try to find a way to extricate his ship from the reef, an action which Nasir tried to stop but was unable to prevent, as he was actually trespassing on Goldoa, a closed land that did not take kindly to unwelcome guests. The noise of the recent battle with the Sky Pirates had aroused the attention of the natives, who were Lagoose of the Dragon Tribe. Though the punishment for trespassing into their land was death, the prince of Goldoa, Kurthnaga, just happened to be there, and he swiftly forgave the blunder of Ike, and instead took the moment to enjoy the chance to converse with an open-minded Bayork. After this friendly encounter, at Kurthnaga's command, three of his companions transformed and began to pull the ship from the reef, and before long, the princess and her guardians were on their way again. 
As the ship neared their destination of Binyon, they happened to chance upon a different ship in peril. After assisting the Binyon soldiers against the forces of Dane and their allies the Crow Lagoose of Kilvis, who had been hired by the captain, Ike returned back to his vessel only to find that Soren had discovered a little girl hiding aboard. Despite her small stature, the girl spoke with great authority, as she slowly became more and more frustrated with the mercenaries' ignorance of her. When she could no longer take any more, this girl suddenly revealed that she was Sanaki, apostle and leader of the entire Binyon Empire. Despite the offense first taken, Sanaki was familiar with Alencia and welcomed the group into her care, if only just to hear their claims and judge the validity of them. After docking at the castle, Sanaki welcomed them into her palace. Unfortunately, the simple and straightforward nature of Ike made him extremely unfit and uncomfortable in the theatricality of the royal court, and after becoming openly flustered and frustrated with Sanaki's probings into the truth of Alencia's identity, the apostle revealed that she was merely testing them and that the the man known as Sephiran had already spoken for them. In actuality, he was Duke Belsis, the Prime Minister of Binyon and the Apostle's closest advisor. After Sanaki dismissed the Crimeans in order to deliberate what to do with them, Ike and the others accustomed themselves to their new lodgings. Though the following days were uneventful, eventually the Grail mercenaries were given a task, issued out by Sanaki herself. Believing that appeasing her would help to persuade Binyon to their cause, Ike and company quickly set themselves to the task the Apostle placed before them. Their first job had them confronting a trade caravan, an operation which was a smokescreen for their actual product, the transporting of Lagoose slaves. Just as Ike's group began battling with this despicable crew, elsewhere in the continent, the kings of the Lagoose tribes were assembling. Arranged by the dragon king Degencia of Goldoa, for the first time in a long time, King Cunigus of Gallia, King Tibarn of Phoenicus, Prince Racin of Serenus, and King Nesala of Kilvis were assembled, and together they spoke of the recent Bayork proceedings and of the flight of the Crimean princess. Of the topics covered, the most critical was Gallia and Goldoa's request for the other tribes not to engage in outright war with Dan, even if Gallia was attacked. Degencia especially knew that this would lead to Binyan being being lost as an ally and igniting a war between all Bayork and Lagoose, something which was a real danger outside of the violence itself due to an object named Leron's Medallion still being somewhere out there in the world. Jumping back to Ike, after completing his first task for the Apostle, he was then hired to eliminate a second bandit threat in some nearby ruins. As Ike proceeded through the harsh desert and battled this foe, elsewhere the King of Kilvis, Nesala, had convinced Prince Racin to join him to discuss what actions he may want to take against Binyon. Raisin, along with his father, was one of the last remaining Heron Lagoose after a terrible event which happened 20 years prior. That day, known as the Serenus Massacre, saw the people of Binyon invade the Heron's home forest and begin burning it while slaughtering nearly all of Raisin's tribe. Though Nesala presented himself as a friend, in truth he was willing to do almost anything to advance his position and the power of his nation, and his meeting Raisin here was actually a trap he had set up for the unfortunate prince, whose beautiful white wings and delicate features were sought after by one of the highest Binyan court members directly involved in the Lagoose slave trade, Duke Oliver Tennis, who, let's just say, appreciated beauty to an extreme degree. After Ike and his mercenaries finished defeating the bandits in the desert, they stopped their assault after learning that they were in fact not bandits, but instead a local group of Lagoose who were fighting for the liberation of their enslaved tribesmen. After sparing them and returning to the Apostle, Ike and the leader of the Liberators realized why Sanaki had sent them on these specific missions. Through her subtle actions, Ike and company had realized the corruption happening within Binyon, and that the Apostle herself could not eliminate it alone. Instead, by giving them these missions, they had already dealt the first blow against it themselves. With a new understanding between Ike and the Apostle, Sanaki next sent them to investigate the mansion of Duke Tanis, where they quickly discovered the captured Prince Racin and struggled with his guards while the Duke fled. After freeing Racin, instead of receiving gratitude, Ike was harshly rebuffed by him, who then flew off to his home of Serenus Forest, planning on taking drastic action against the humans. This was also where Duke Tanis had fled, and with Within the massive forest, Ike's group was closing in on him. As these three were making their way through the burnt remains of the Heron's home, unbeknownst to any of them, King Tibarn of Phoenicus was also arriving, having heard of Raisin's fate from an advisor to Nesala. After finding the prince above the trees, the king learned of Raisin's plan to sing what was called the Dirge of Ruin, 
forbidden magic that only the Heron tribe could perform at great personal sacrifice. Before Raisin could go through with this, an event happened that no one could have predicted. After fighting through some of the Duke's men, from out of the trees, very close to Ike, a female Heron Lagoose, speaking only in an ancient tongue, suddenly approached and then collapsed on the ground in front of them. With everyone stunned to find another survivor of the Heron tribe massacre nearly 20 years later, Ike lifted the girl onto his back and began to risk his own life to protect her. Seeing this human fighting other humans, all to protect a Lagoose he didn't know, stunned Tibarn and even Prince Raisin. And despite this going against everything they had known before, without a second thought, they all joined on the battlefield together, fighting alongside Ike and his mercenaries. This nigh unheard of meeting of minds between Bayork and Lagoose, which had been unknowingly brought together by the natural compassion of Ike, was the turning point in the fate of the entire land of Tellius. Following the battle, it was Prince Raisin who approached Ike, stunned beyond words to find the girl he saved was indeed his lost sister, Leon who had been protected by the forest itself after all these years. What shocked the Hawk and the Herons more so was that this act of compassion by Ike was in truth originated at the behest of the Binyan Apostle. And now Sanaki arrived, proving the sincerity of her compassion and her people's regret by prostrating herself before Prince Raisin, an unthinkable act for the Empire's holy leader to do. Through the kindness displayed in the Serenus Forest, a bridge between the two races had been built. After Prince Raisin agreed to his sister to abandon his revenge, the two began a new song, singing life back into the forest and beginning the true healing process. Through Ike's efforts, he had helped to make Sanaki's dream come true, and in return, she pledged to back Princess Alencia, setting what forces she could spare at the command of Ike. Coming along with him would be Prince Raisin, who not so long ago couldn't even bear to be helped by him. And on top of this, even King Tibarn of Phoenicus granted him two of his most powerful and trusted allies. At Princess Alencia's request, Ike reluctantly accepted the title of General of the Crimean Army. They had come a long way together, yet the Mad King Ashnard was still out there. The Black Knight was still out there. It was time to turn this war back onto Dayan. The newly appointed Lord Ike at last was on the offensive. With an army of Binyans, Crimeans, Lagoos, and even some Dayans behind him, the new force set out by land, crossing the border and marching straight into the country of Dayan. Here again, his army encountered Nesala, the king of Kilvis, who had sold his services to Dayan in order to advance his nation. Although the king was a mighty opponent, it was words rather than brawn that bested him. For as soon as he heard that the second heron, Lian, had been rescued by Ike, he could no longer pledge his forces against him, and quickly abandon his former contract. After capturing a nearby fort, the Crimean army found a massive store of gold, and though Ike used most of it to pay and resupply his army, he took some of it and approached the thief Volk, finally giving him the 50,000 he had asked for, for the information that he had gotten for Grail. In truth, there was no information. It was a trick. Yet, in an act of at least some compassion, Volk did provide some very useful information. He was not by trade a thief. In actuality, he was an extremely dangerous assassin. He had come to know Grail after the man wished to hire him for his services as a killer, not as a spy. He then revealed to Ike that at one point, his father was known as Gawain, and he was one of the four riders of Dayan, perhaps the most powerful man of his age. At some point, he and his wife Elena had fled their homeland, with her carrying a special medallion that they wished to keep hidden. This was no mere trinket. Rather, it was an item that contained a sealed dark god. It was known as Laron's medallion to some, and the fire emblem to others. When touched by those without a specific balance of order and chaos inside, it would cause them to become enraged and monstrous in power, an incident which Grail experienced by accident. As he raged, berserk, and killing with little thought, his wife Elena stepped in front of him to try to calm him down. When his mind became clear, he found that he had pierced his sword completely through her. Horrified by the murder of his wife by his own hand, Grail slashed the tendons in his sword hand, purposefully ruining the great sword skills which had made him a legend. Having now been brought down to Volk's caliber, the assassin agreed that if Grail were to ever go mad again, he would be the one to stop him. Like their mother, Mist was one of the few people able to touch the medallion safely. Yet, only a few days after learning the truth, Ike was approached by an extremely distraught Mist. 
The medallion had suddenly gone missing, as if it had been stolen right out of their camp. Although this was a troubling development, Ike had to keep focused on the task at hand, and before long, he arrived at the Dayan capital of Nivasa, expecting to find King Ashnard within. What awaited Ike was not the king, but instead an ambush of some of the country's finest soldiers, including a young mysterious girl named Inna waiting on the throne. In an act that surprised everyone, even the Dayan general stationed within, Inna revealed herself to be a dragon lagoose, and for the first time ever, the Grail mercenaries faced the terrifying danger of a dragon's true power. Despite her being their toughest opponent yet, eventually even Inna was bested by their group. It was then that Nasir appeared, inexplicably coming to the rescue of the cornered girl. Holding back Ike's company until Inna was safely away, Nasir then allowed himself to be captured, revealing that it was also him who had stolen the medallion and passed it to Inna so that she could deliver it to Ashnard. As a shameful Nasir became silent, he did give the group one hint, saying that they should next visit Palmini, a shrine within Dayan. Before leaving to investigate what this place was, Ike's first group of reinforcements from Binyan arrived, with General Zelgius warmly greeting him. Leaving Zelgius to hold the capital, Ike's group investigated Palmini Temple, and after removing some bandits who were holding the local priesthood captive, they found the reason for Nasir's mysterious hint. At one point, one of the rooms within the shrine had been used to hold a prisoner, and from the ancient writing on the wall, they could tell it was a heron. Through reading the words written, Prince Rayson was able to identify that the unfortunate one was none other than his older sister Lilia, who had spent her days in this room until her death. Amongst the writings, he also found found out that she had been holding Laron's medallion, and had entrusted it, as well as a special song, to a blue-haired, blue-eyed Bayark woman who worked at the shrine. This woman was Elena, Ike and Miss' mother, and with this knowledge, the siblings were finally able to piece together why Grail and Elena had fled Dayan. They had been told to teach the song and hand the medallion to a girl named Altina, but before ever finishing their goal, Grail had mistakenly touched the medallion and gone on the rampage that ended Elena's life. Due to Grail having no leads on who this Altina person was, he then set up his company in Crimea and attempted to eke out a living as the leader of a simple mercenary band. In order to honor both of their parents' sacrifices, Ike and Mist agreed to retrieve the medallion again and find this Altina, all so they could fulfill the promise that both of their parents had died for. After returning to Castle Navasa, Ike passed the sovereignty of the country of Dane to the Apostle through handing powers to General Zelgius, and then he finally set out for his final goal, the return of Princess Alencia to the Crimean capital, and the defeat of King Ashnard and his Black Knight. In order to get back into the country of Crimea, Ike's group had to pass through a bridge connecting the two, and although he suffered a few pitfalls along the way, he was able to confront General Patrine who was guarding it, and arrive back in their homeland yet again. After merging the surviving Crimean forces into their army, that night Ike left his encampment, finding the Black Knight waiting for him outside. Feeling he was finally ready, Ike challenged the man, but quickly found, just like everyone else, he could do nothing to even so much as scratch the knight's armor. It was the Black Knight himself who explained why, revealing that his armor had been blessed by the goddess herself, and that only a similarly blessed sword, such as the one he had attempted to give Grail during their duel, could do any damage to him. Giving Ike one more chance to challenge him, but with an appropriate weapon, the Black Knight left, and the following day, they began their approach on the capital, finding a massive number of Dayan troops holding two forts directly in their path. To help them get past this heavily fortified position, King Tibarn reunited with the group and agreed to distract one with his forces while Ike and his troops took the other. When everything was ready, the largest clash of the war took place, with the Dayans of Ike's fort being led by the mysterious Bertram, another one of the four riders. By the end of the day, even he had been defeated, along with roughly half of Dayan's forces just as planned. After reconvening with Tabarn, the Hawk King told Ike of one knight clad all in black, whose power was beyond anything he or the others had witnessed, who Ike instantly recognized as the Black Knight he had been seeking. And Ike knew it was time to utilize the weapon he had been hiding since the night of his father's death. Ragnell. With this in hand, he was now ready to face the knight, and the very next day, Ike assaulted the second fort, eagerly anticipating the moment for him to unsheath the Ragnell and stand on even ground with his father's killer. Finding him inside as expected, Ike intended to duel him alone, 
but nevertheless found his sister Mist joining in to watch his back and to heal him. As expected, the Black Knight was no normal foe. Yet as Ike and the Knight's holy blades clashed back and forth, the seemingly untouchable tank of a man suddenly began struggling to keep his footing, before finally collapsing to the ground. Finding an injured Inna beyond the Knight, whom Ashnard had ordered killed for her failure, Nasir, who had somehow escaped his bonds, had arrived to also assist them, and together the group safely escaped, leaving the Knight to be buried by the rubble. Feeling it was now time, Nasir revealed his identity, explaining that he was one of the dragon tribe, and despite his looks, was actually Enna's grandfather. The girl had had someone very close to her kidnapped by King Ashnard, and Nasir had only helped the Danes in order to keep Enna and her loved one safe. Naturally, Ike forgave his former friend, and with this, the two dragons joined with the Crimean army in order to help them stand up against the remainder of Dayan soldiers and to defeat King Ashnard themselves. As the siege of Princess Alencia's former home began, inside the castle, they found King Ashnard at taking to the field himself, anticipating his battle with Ike while practically ignoring the princess. During their fight, King Ashnard revealed his intentions. For many years, he had been seeking to free the Dark God from Laron's medallion, knowing that its release would bring destruction to the world. The Mad King wished to cause such an event so that he could wipe away the weak from the world all at once, and instead lead a new society where only the strong could survive. It was to this end that he had kidnapped Princess Lilia of the Herons during the Serenus Massacre 20 years back, not knowing that only the one known as Altina could release the god. It was also to this end that he had instigated the war now, hoping to cause enough chaos and bloodshed so that the god could still be released even without Altina's song. For as long as he could be allowed to live, he would never stop seeking this goal. And so the only answer now was for the heroes gathered to finally put him down for good. As once again, Holy Blade struck Holy Blade, Ike and all of his friends fought on, until finally a mortal blow had been struck on the Mad King, and Ashnard slowly sank in his seat. Refusing to give up, even with his life draining out of him, Ashnard attempted one final revenge, taking out Laron's medallion and touching it, which instantly sent him into an all-powerful berserk rage, yet somehow he still kept his sanity. After taking on and defeating this berserk Ashnard again, at long Long last, the terror of his reign was finished. Slumped on the floor, away from the king's body was his mount, Rajion which Inna surprisingly threw herself towards, embracing what the others had thought was a simple wyvern. Rajion was actually a dragon Laguse and Inna's mate, who had been driven mad through Ashnar's Laguse experiments. Suddenly, the voices of the herons, Lian and Raisin, rang out once more. Through their healing magic, Rajion had been restored. At long last, the two dragon lovers had been reunited. Finding Leron's medallion on the ground nearby, Mist safely recovered it, before eventually giving it back to its rightful owners. As peace returned to Crimea, Alencia was named the queen. Speaking with Sephiran, who suddenly reappeared yet again, Ike and Mist were able to learn that the mysterious Altina they had been seeking was in fact the current inheritor of the bloodline of the Apostle, none other than Sanaki. Despite having some journeys still ahead, Ike, Mist, Queen Alencia, and all of their many allies, both Bayork and Lagus, continued to strive to make the future ahead of them a radiant dawn for all. Path of Radiance was meant to be a significant step forward in storytelling and presentation for its series, and without a doubt it was. It was also a lot more. I had high hopes, to be sure, but the multitude of ways in which this game exceeded its predecessors was not something that I was quite ready for. To just get the obvious out of the way. For a series which has primarily told its story through top-down angles without a moving camera or much flair, the introduction of the CG cinematics, which were done by the acclaimed producer Digital Frontier, was a breath of fresh air. And although the English voice acting in these was acceptable at best, each of them was a treat to see. On top of these, as was dabbled with before, still art scenes are used throughout the story, which continue to do a great job at establishing some of the game's most important scenes without resorting 
into full-on pre-rendered video. I'm a big fan of putting this art into the scenes, and I love how their usage in conjunction with the dialogue gives the game a bit of a visual novel feeling. Although it's easy to talk about this big step up in presentation, one of the biggest challenges with fully covering what intelligent systems came up with here is the sheer scale of this story. Honestly, it's impressive that a plot this dense was also built to set up a second game. There's so much going on here, most of which is resolved satisfactorily, that it gives me great respect for the writers who clearly spent a very long time fitting it all together. Not to mention the translators who just as obviously poured in a lot of love into bringing this story into English. Since this game is the first in a new setting, there is a ton of world and character building to do, something that this series has actually consistently excelled in. We have the introduction of our protagonist Ike, the fleshing out of his relationships with his sister and the other mercenaries, the introduction of Tellius and its many countries and major inhabitants, which also includes a completely new kind of race that features prominently in the story, which in and of itself is split into multiple tribes and nations. On top of this, there is a lot of backstory to get through through, such as the burning of Serena's forest, and how this played into multiple story threads that we experienced in-game, such as King Ashnard's evil plan which began there. On top of that, we have Crimea's relationship with Galia, the assassination of the previous apostle, the different bird tribes relationship with each other, the history of the goddess and the flooding of the world, and on and on the list goes. This actually brings me to one of my first points. A lot happens in Path of Radiance. Even compared to most other Fire Emblem games to this point, FE9 is a very long game, and a large amount of that time will be spent on simply reading the story, which is extremely, and some might say excessively, text heavy. I learned this quite clearly in my blind playthrough streams, where I sometimes had to stop reading aloud in order to just rest my voice or from sheer fatigue. Now, I do really love games which take their time to fully flesh themselves out, but the sheer amount of writing here can easily become excessive. Fortunately though, there are some ways where FE9 alleviates this and keeps its story from becoming a twisted mess. One of the best of these comes right away, and by this I mean Ike. During the development phase, one of the most requested features by the male staff members was for the next game's protagonist to be a mercenary rather than a royal, which is why Ike is the first Fire Emblem lead to not be a lord right off the bat. Besides the perspective shift this brought, entering the story from Ike's vantage point does a great job at easing new players into the world of Tellius, without necessitating cramming in the history and its current political climate right away. We spend the opening just doing jobs for Grail's mercenary company. It even takes takes a couple of chapters until we see our first map of the world and find out where we've been this whole time. As Ike's path takes him into Galia and beyond, like us, he's learning about these places for the first time, and having them explained to him in practical terms. Having the solid foundation of a protagonist for players to inhabit like this makes the massive amounts of information presented to the player across an entire playthrough a lot easier to swallow. For example, even if a player couldn't quite grasp how different the culture of Binyon was from Crimea, because we know Ike and can relate to his position, understanding can be achieved simply by witnessing his reactions to various aspects of Binyon society. A second way in which Fire Emblem 9 makes its scale more manageable is through the use of info scenes that become available at the base between chapters. These are additional conversations that often have no purpose besides fleshing out characters or each new setting. There are a few of these conversations which actually do give you some great rewards just for checking them out, such as items, new units, or access to the triangle attack. But, in a very wise move, these special conversations are marked and always have three stars. This is a great compromise. Players who are very into the story can read these in addition to all the others, while players who are more in it just for the gameplay can just check for three-star conversations and leave the others hanging. I would definitely recommend checking some of these out, because many of them turned out to be some of my favorite moments in the game. They offer a fascinating ground view look at the characters, and can also cover a wide range of tones. Going anywhere from melancholic, such as the scene depicting Titania's despair following the death of Grail, to outright humorous, such as the scene in which Ike attempts to get Volk to just eat his meals with everybody else so that Mist can stop worrying about it. Considering the amount of character development they offer, these extra conversations could have served as a decent replacement for the support system 
due to how they allow all players to learn about the cast and also don't affect your deployment options. This was not the case though, and the support system remains in, although with some very significant changes that we'll be getting into here and later gameplay chapters. When it comes to their impact on the storytelling, moving support conversations away from the battlefield and into the base was a very, very wise decision. There always was an uncomfortable suspension of disbelief that players had to do in order to enjoy any of the support content from prior entries. But one knock-on effect of this is that when your supports open up at the same time as info conversations, for players who are interested in reading all these, huge amounts of time can be spent between the battles. In some cases, I would see 30 minutes to an hour go by before actually beginning the next chapters. Part of what made this more than acceptable to me was this game's excellent cast of playable units who easily stick out in memory due to how much effort is put into establishing each one very clearly. This was an issue that Fire Emblem 8 had. At a glance, its units would almost look like stock characters, but some had great writing to them locked behind support conversations. Thanks to how the Path of Radiance characters are included and fleshed out in the required story scenes, as well as the free development of the info scenes, without even taking supports into account, looking back on the roster now, I can fondly remember each and every one of them, which I think is a really good sign. First impressions should not be so easily thrown away. One recurring topic throughout this game, and seen in many of these characters' dialogue scenes, is the relationship between the Bayork and Laguse, and the history of atrocities between them. Trying to tackle racism is not a goal that many games would try to aim for, but I do think that Path of Radiance at least makes an admirable attempt. First of all, this isn't just some minor side issue. Many of the conversations have to do with misunderstandings between the two races, as well as how prejudice, scapegoating, and willful ignorance about other cultures can take us on a terrible path. This is quite literal in the story. King Ashnard's plan is to instigate what is basically a race war, which will directly lead to global destruction. And although of course we get to defeat his army in the story, special mention should also go to how his ideology is defeated through the peaceful bridging of cultures. Beyond this macro level, we also have smaller scale resolution, such as the conversations between Jill and Leth, which stand out as a particular high point of this game's development. Their conversations wonderfully tie into the progression of the plot, in order to show how both Bayork and Laguse can start to question their previous assumptions about each other after actually spending time with one another. They learn how, in many ways, they are more alike than different. For someone who has spent most of his adult life living abroad, this was very resonant to me. The reason why Path of Radiance is able to approach these kind of topics without becoming intolerable is likely due to its holistic approach to world building. Simple touches like having the Heron Laguse speak their own ancient language, considering what kinds of foods the Hawk tribes would actually eat, or even just giving the Lagoos their own word for humans, show how a lot more thought was put into the small details here, which compares it favorably not only to prior Fire Emblem games, but even to a lot of fantasy writing in general. This is something that a lot of other games and works could learn from. Even though the world building and presentation of this game really are on a different scale, there are still a multitude of areas which end up feeling rather underdeveloped that I want to mention. I can only hope that many of these end up paying off in Radiant Dawn, because they certainly didn't do so here. How about we start with the Black Knight? Finally, I know. Much like Darth Vader in the context of only the first Star Wars movie, he mainly serves as this story's big, tough henchman who kills the mentor and does the dirty work of the villain in charge. It's good that he does have a bit more development to him, especially with how this story sets up the idea that he may have shifting motivations, as well as a history with Ike's father and Sephiran. But so far, I haven't had anything to say about the knight until now, because he's just such obvious sequel bait. You can't have this guy murder Ike's father and just never bring up his identity in this game. Even without having played the sequel yet, I can say for certain that he's still alive and they're not going to just leave this open, even though that would be pretty ballsy. Just as guaranteed to pay off next time is Leron's medallion. But to be honest, for as much time as spent unraveling exactly what it is and what it can do during this game's runtime, I was very surprised and a bit underwhelmed to find out that it built up to nothing more in this game other than adding an extra phase to the Ashnard fight in the harder difficulties. Obviously, this medallion story will 
go somewhere in the sequel, but setting things up for a sequel should never come at the expense of making a story feel whole right now, especially in critically important sections such as the ending. By this same merit, this also goes with the shooing in of the Rajion plot, which is inappropriately concluded immediately after defeating the final boss of the game. Stealing away the focus of the player's victory over the game's main villain, just to give resolution to a minor plot which could have just come during the epilogue. In a story of this size, a few oversights and issues don't really take away much from the greater whole, especially when it is such a constant joy to experience. Obviously, I really did enjoy the story of Path of Radiance, and though it didn't have any unforgettable gut punches like Genealogy of the Holy War, finally learning about the tale of Ike and the world which was crafted around him was an absolute absolute pleasure, and I would undoubtedly put this story up there as one of my favorites thus far. Naturally, I am really hoping for an equally excellent follow-up plot, but we are a ways off from thinking about that for now, especially when the many gameplay evolutions seen here merit so much more immediate discussion. Even though the development times determined Path of Radiance to be called Fire Emblem 9 and the Sacred Stones to be called Fire Emblem 8, I like to keep in mind that they were mostly in development simultaneously by separate teams within Intelligent Systems. Path of Radiance wasn't built for some of the big new systems of that game, such as adding branching promotions or an extended post-game. You can kind of think of both of these games as the sequels to Fire Emblem 7, but of course, being the big return to console gaming meant that Path of Radiance got most of the attention, which is likely why it brings a lot more new ideas to the table than the average entry. Let's just start off with one of the biggest changes first, the Lagoose, which basically takes the reoccurring Manakeet units from prior entries and broadens the idea. Transforming units like these have used many different mechanics in the past, and the Lagoose here actually work similarly to the Dragons of Fire Emblem 3, a style which actually hasn't been attempted since that game. Rather than being able to manually transform like back then, Lagoose here work instead off of a charging bar that is filled either through turns passing or them being attacked. And although they gain a massive amount of power when transformed, this is balanced by them being unable to fight back while untransformed. In this game, it's pretty safe to say that all of your Lagoose allies join your party extremely powerful, needing zero training to start immediately contributing a lot, some of which start battles already transformed, while others start out with little to no charge, thus giving them different periods of time where they're really effective in. Both the early Transformers and the late Transformers have their uses, but I found in general the characters like Leth, who starts out transformed, ended up being a lot more useful, as you can often finish a lot of maps before their transformation even ends. Or at the very least, keep up with the faster marching pace of your units and guarantee that they can quickly start doing something. Since we're bringing up especially good Lagoos right now, let's talk about Raisin, the only member of the Heron Clan that joins you. Unlike the other fighting Lagoos, he is able to to chant, which reinvigorates your units just like a dancer. But when he enters his transform state, he is able to do the same thing, but now for all four units surrounding him, just like the dancers from FE4. Dancer type units are already good enough when they just give a single unit another turn. And after completing Genealogy, I felt for sure that no other game would bring back this mechanic, nor would I have guessed that on top of this insane power, they would also just give that unit the ability to fly. Having a unit with this much utility is as ridiculously broken as it is fun just as it was in Genealogy. As long as you have your Transform race and in range, you're basically getting four more units to use each turn, which needless to say can drastically swing things in your favor in little time. Getting off perfect four unit chance every time would be a lot more difficult without the one other feature which returned that also shocked me. And of course I'm talking about Kanto. Kanto refers to mounted units being able to use the rest of their movement ability after doing an action. I already covered this in detail on my Fire Emblem 4 video, and I also covered this in the Binding Blade video where I talked about that version, which doesn't give you your extra movement after attacking, was probably the most fair option. Rather than reiterate, I'll just say right now that the return of Kanto has some implications, and these are things that I can't say that I'm a fan of. The short version is the ability to Kanto completely alters the capabilities of mounted units, giving them a ridiculous benefit for little to no drawback. 
Here's how I see it. Whenever you order a unit to attack, their movement comes with an opportunity cost. For example, if you move your axe fighter forward to swing at a foe, it leaves him in the way of your other units. That enemy can't be attacked again at one range from the same tile. Decision making comes when you have to decide whether to block yourself with that fighter, or send a different unit in, choose to have them attack or not, as well as other details like the current terrain they're both on. Kanto kind of kills this decision making. Rather than using a foot unit, which can only make that one choice, you can do the same action with a mounted unit, and then use that extra movement to either put them directly into the next fight, send them backwards for a healer, or set them up for a race and quadruple play. I realize that there's technically no reason for the Fire Emblem series to try to achieve perfect balance. At the end of the day, it is a single player game, and the computer certainly isn't going to complain about unbalanced mechanics. At the same time, I don't think that a unit should have so much of its value instantly decided by a single factor. Although it took me some time at first, my experience with the series thus far has taught me the true potential of mounted units. Even without Kanto, they were already very, very good. I will never argue that these buffs make them unfun, just that there needs to be a valid counterbalance to make the choice of whether to use them or not an actually interesting one. Flyers are already excellent, but they do have to watch out for bows on occasion. Even with the return to double effective damage in this game, they do still get zoned out from time to time, especially on harder difficulties. Horse-mounted units, and especially paladins, have little regard for any checks and balances on their abilities. It's nice that they're locked to a single weapon type while still cavaliers, but are one of the classes in this game which are given a choice over which other weapon type to gain upon promoting, which allows them all to instantly get around their own weaknesses and continue overperforming. Little changes like this really call into question why they seem so eager to fix what wasn't broken, especially when this game features other questionable ideas, such as the removal of combat stats during animations, half-baked tedious stealth mechanics that only appear on a few maps, the complete absence of dark magic for little reason, as well as the separation of knives as a new weapon type for thieves and promoted mages, which are just uniformly awful. While we're on this down streak, I suppose it's time to bring up Biorhythm, a new feature that plays into absolutely every combat encounter in this game, but was almost something I forgot about when it came to writing this video. There's not too much to say about it really. Your character stats are minorly adjusted over time, following a wave-like trajectory. Their position on this Biorhythm chart moves forward one point with every ten battles, and move forward seven points after finishing a chapter. While it's in the green area, they have minorly improved hit and avoid, and while it is in the red area, the opposite. The intentions for this system seems like it was meant to be a lighter version of the Thracia 776 fatigue, meant to be a balancing force to make you think twice about fielding someone with bad biorhythm currently, and go for a different unit on that map instead. This doesn't lock them completely away like Thracia did, which many viewed as overly harsh. However, its weak implementation makes it easily ignored, which is why it often is. Even with some of these questionable introductions, there is a lot of positives still to get to. And before we move on to some of the larger ways in which Path of Radiance impressed, I would be remiss to not mention a few of the smaller improvements which I feel still made an impact. Unit Commands, a mechanic not seen since Fire Emblem Gaiden return. But this time allow for more specific commands on top of the simple rally, and also have thankfully cut out the suicidal assault command of that game. It's not a feature that I used very often, but in the few moments that I wanted it, such as gathering all units at the end of a map for a safe boss clear, it was an invaluable time saver. Next, a very small change that I really liked, weapons can now be simply unequipped. This is best used for body blocking, such as putting a powerful unit in the way of an aggressor while still saving the damage and experience for someone else. This small feature also helps to remove the danger of accidentally killing recruitable enemy units without the need to go the roundabout way of doing this from before, where you have to remove all weapons from a unit's inventory. Last up, but certainly not least, is the shoving system introduced with this game that allows units who are not doubled in weight by an ally or enemy to push them one space away from themselves. 
themselves. I didn't think much of this at first, but once I started putting it to use, the true tactical potential of it became clear. And although it can allow for minor adjustments to positioning, playing this into chains of shoves can allow you to pull off some remarkable plays. If you think about shoving in advance, even units who are unable to reach an enemy can either be made to or instead use their turn helping another unit do so. Mounted units who cannot shove nor be rescued miss out on this mechanic, but of course, thanks to Kanto, they're just fine without it. Even though it was the ninth game in the series, Path of Radiance still managed to bring a wave of changes to the battlefield mechanics. But despite the dramatic revivals and small improvements, it wasn't actually the place where this entry mixed things up the most. Roughly speaking, every Fire Emblem map can be broken into three parts. There's the preparation phase, where players manage their convoy and unit inventories, the story phase, which of course continues the plot and justifies the battle, and then there's the gameplay phase, where all the action happens. Despite it seeming like the gameplay section is the part that should receive the most development each game, my experience making this retrospective series has proved that sometimes simple adjustments to the preparation phase can be just as significant. Path of Radiance does this by introducing the base, a concept not too dissimilar from the My Castle system of genealogy. Once the base unlocks early into the game, players always return to this menu after battle, where significantly more can happen than just adjusting your inventory or using stat boosting items. Since I covered the info conversations in the story analysis section, let's start instead with the gameplay modifications to the support system, which is also accessed here. It was Fire Emblem 4 that pioneered the system of building supports. And although the idea of having units wait together for multiple turns was a fine one for a game with very long maps with so much to do and so much travel time on them, its carryover to the Game Boy Advance games was questionable due to the shorter maps and the number of turns required to grind affection points. As I said in the past, I think the system of tiered support levels is a very good one for this series, but passing turns while the objective of the map sits forgotten always felt like a compromise that I can't imagine anyone was really happy with. Fire Emblem 9 has changed all of that, because now support levels are only raised after having units deployed for a certain number of chapters together, a small tweak which has pretty dramatic results. Just by removing this meta system from the battles, we are returned closer again to the uninterrupted classic Fire Emblem style tactical gameplay. I really do love the idea of growing characters together as the story progresses, and then witnessing their private conversations and breakthrough moments, but the place for this support system on the actual battle battlefields should begin and end with how they affect your unit's stats. While we're here, I just have to say that it's a great change for the game to finally just show you how your characters are improved by being close to their support partner. Even though support bonuses still use a complicated system which involves mixing characters' affinities for a solid boost, transparency like this is something that I love. A little bit of information can really go a long way. The changes to the support system here are something that I think is going to seem very, very obvious in retrospect. I'm not so sure if the same can be said for the forging and bonus experience systems. Forging is a new mechanic which allows you to create your own custom weapons, paying pretty exorbitant amounts of gold to tweak them with improved damage, crit chance, accuracy, weight, and even allowing you to name them. Interestingly, you are also able to make a weapon worse, which, believe it or not, there are actually very good reasons to do, such as giving a weakened weapon to a stronger unit so that they can reliably set up kills for other units at will. Given how much a forged weapon can push battles in your favor, I do think it was a smart idea to limit them to one forge per chapter, as well as to make it as expensive as it is. Even without an arena, Path of Radiance showers you in money, and forges actually give you something to spend it on. Next up, let's talk about the other big addition to the base, bonus experience. Following each chapter, Soren will give you a rundown on Ike's accumulated resources, including how much of this bonus experience is available to you. Naturally, this is experience that you are allowed to freely hand out as you wish, and though it is gained in multiple different ways depending on each chapter, in general, performing better on maps, such as finishing them with less wasted turns, will see a higher payout. The amount of experience gained varies with difficulty, but it isn't uncommon to suddenly find yourself with loads of it, allowing you to use it to power up or 
catch up whichever unit you wish. Like the skirmish battles of prior games, bonus experience is a powerful and easy to use tool, but proves itself the much better system due to it A being a limited resource that B actually rewards players for trying hard. The one downside of bonus experience is just how much it can cheapen the game's already pretty light difficulty, especially when used in conjunction with weapon forging. Add in the fact that this game introduces auto promotion, which means that any units who would be hitting level 21 go ahead and class change without needing to use a master seal. Combined power systems like this can allow any player to take a bad unit like Rolf and turn him into some kind of nerd slaying ubermensch that can really take over your game. Not that anyone would even bother doing such a stupid thing, of course. Even with this potential, I really do appreciate systems like this over innate buffs like Kanto, due to it giving decision-making power back to the player, rather than arbitrarily handing out extra value. This is why an item like the Night Ring, which sees its first return since Genealogy, is such a fantastic addition. This is an item that can grant the benefits of Kanto to any other unit, and there's just such a feeling of gravity and importance when you yourself are handing out such an enormous buff, not to mention a feeling of attachment to that specific unit. After all, you are the one that chose them, not the developers. Clearly, intelligent systems were aware of this kind of thinking, because the skills system here is built on this whole premise. Skills in Path of Radiance are mainly an evolution and nerfing of the same system that Thracia 776 used, with the potential to learn more through specific items. FE9 alters this by giving each unit a maximum skill capacity. A lot different costs to different skills. Skills can be removed, but when you do so, they are lost forever, which means that while you are encouraged to invest into your favorite units once you get a skill that works well for how you're using them, you can never make that decision lightly. New to this game are mastery skills, which can only be learned through the use of the rare occult scroll, which teaches a very strong skill to any promoted unit. These masteries are very expensive in capacity, but they have the potential to make your unit a lot more powerful with one example being the Aether skill that can activate both Soul, a healing strike, and Luna, an attack that ignores defense. Not all skills are this powerful though, and there seems to have been an effort to balance these much better than before. And in some ways it does work. If we look at genealogy in Thracia's version of Astra, it basically just meant an instant kill on almost everybody. In FE9, successive strikes from this skill are now reduced in damage, toning down the previous damage total by about half. As far as I'm concerned, this is a fine change. Even if it was only double damage, this skill would still be more than welcome. While we have reasonable examples like that, other skills in this game can have much more questionable value. Something that we can see in the Sniper's Deadeye, which costs 20 capacity to allow one of the most accurate classes in the game to always hit, and have a skill divided by two chance to put an enemy to sleep. This is definitely not one of the more desirable skills out there. Cases like this make it feel like the developers were being way overly cautious to not let skills take over the combat, which although is definitely a wise course of action, it is one that happens to be very ironic due to the existence of Wrath with Resolve. Both of these skills work off a unit being at half health or less, which means that after a small setup, you'll be getting a nigh unkillable unit who is constantly landing critical hits. This combo alone practically contains enough potential to suddenly have one unit carry the late game. And I really don't think this is a developer oversight. Toroneo, a late game general who is perfect for such a combo due to his high defense, already comes with half of this puzzle. Another good target for this combo is Ike, but it's actually impossible to get him to learn both of these skills in combination until after a critical boss fight very late into the game. This whole situation shows a little bit of mixed priorities. While Intelligent Systems was willing to introduce great power with a steady hand keeping it in check, just in general, interesting cases like this are the exception, not the rule. Clearly, there has been a lot to bring up when trying to cover Fire Emblem 9's significance. It has taken me longer than any video I've ever created previously on this channel. But I think, at last, it's finally time that we wrap these myriad of topics into one conclusion.
Fire Emblem 9 Path of Radiance was envisioned from the start to be the game that would launch the new era of Fire Emblem. And after examining everything that it brought to the table, I can say nothing to deny this. After a series of safe bets with the Game Boy Advance entries, it was incredibly refreshing to see intelligent systems bring out so many new ideas at once. In a way, it reminds me of the Super Famicom days of the series, and just how much Shozo Kaga and his team dared to innovate with every sequel. Like those early games, not every new system or story beat perfectly lands. But when considering my overall experience here, the blemishes that do exist blur painlessly into the background. What I will remember about this game is its fantastic main character, who gave a very fresh perspective for once. Plenty of memorable allies and villains who inhabit the most fleshed out world in this series. Of course, we have a huge wave of gameplay improvements, particularly in army management, and a great collection of maps which challenge the player in a variety of settings. I wish I could say that fair balance between the classes and snappy, satisfying animations were a part of this picture, but that's something that I can't. Compared to the rest of what this game brought to the table, these complaints are petty. Like Genealogy of the Holy War, this game suffers most from over-ambition, which I think is a noble fault to carry, and one which time and experience can rectify, which is why this is yet another entry that is perfect for a remake. Just like with Genealogy, whether it gets one or not, experiencing Path of Radiance in its original form is a journey well worth undertaking. I am very happy to say that my years of curiosity about Ike and his companions really did pay off. Discovering the depths of this game's accomplishments was an absolute treat, and Path of Radiance was yet another game for me to treasure on the wonderful path this series has set me on. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective takes us back into Tellius, three years after the events of Path of Radiance. Be sure to join me next time as we jump into the tale of Micaiah and the Dawn Brigade, on their quest to save their homeland in Fire Emblem 10, Radiant Dawn. If you don't feel like waiting, you can watch the Radiant Dawn retrospective right now. All you need to do is click the link on screen or in the description to become a Patreon supporter. For as little as $1, you can gain one week early access to my videos, including the Radiant Dawn retrospective, which just became available right this instant. If you'd like the support for more, you can gain further benefits, such as being able to watch all four videos in the current season of retrospectives right now for $3, or gain immediate access to everything I do without ever having to wait for a season's completion for $5. Please consider helping my channel grow and this series continue with your support today. Thank you so much for watching everybody. Special thanks to my Grand Commander patrons Connie Reed, DW7 Still Rules, Rarthorn, True Tactician, Radiant Archiver, Henry Gutierrez, Minute Rice, and Ignis Isol, as well as to all of my other Patreon supporters. Thank you all very much.